morning to all of you. My regards and my best wishes to all of you. I am really grateful to the Department of Anthropology of Delhi University and the conveners of this particular webinar to confer upon me this honor of speaking to, to you. As you know, that these days a large number of webinars and discussions are taking place on COVID-19. And you find that there's almost a recycling of the same body of information. You go to any webinar and you find people speaking about the things which you already, already know, although it is put up in different, different words. Now, the question which comes before me, and I'm sure it will come before all of you, is that how an anthropologist would look at this? What would be the anthropological perspective on, on this, where we would be different from the others, from the, the kind of work that is being done? In fact, in one of the lectures I delivered on, uh, on Corona, I noted the number of narratives which are being produced. I think so many narratives have never you know, taken place in the past as they are now. And so many kinds of discourses which are coming on this, which is a separate topic of study. I thought that as an anthropologist, I must draw your kind attention to the people who are very dear to us, the people who are muted and silenced, people who are at the bottom of the hierarchy, the so-called tribal communities. It so happened that being in the Anthropological Survey of India, we just finished a, a major project on the denotified nomadic and semi-nomadic communities. In fact, just a few days back, we submitted 48 reports to Niti Ayo, which in fact run into 3,700 pages or so on these, uh, these communities. And tomorrow, I'm sure you will be able to, able to see them. Now, it just occurred to me one fine morning and that uh, these are the months, the months of April, May and June, when a large number of these forest-based communities, the forest-based tribals, they go for collection of what are called minor forest products. They go. And I had read from the newspaper that the government has allowed them to go and do the collections. They can, they can do this, provided they observe the norms of social distancing and also they take care of, of themselves. So I knew about it, but immediately the second question which came to my mind was, what about the sale? Because the traders were not allowed to come to the tribal areas. So what would be happening to that? And this set me thinking, and I thought it would be a, as an anthropologist, in the role of an anthropologist, it would be an important contribution we can make in case we are able to identify the areas where tribal communities, particularly the so-called PVTGs, particularly vulnerable tribal groups, particularly the denotified nomadic and semi-nomadic communities, how they have been influenced by this, how they have been impacted by this. And just because newspapers, of course, are giving little attention to them, but the newspapers are not paying the kind of attention which they are giving, for example, to the vaccine or uh, to other areas, then to tribal communities. And it will be a good idea to work. Now, the major thing is, which has been pointed out by many people in other webinars, is how to collect the information. And this worry has often been raised that these are the days when we 
cannot go out and conduct field work, the kind of field work we had been accustomed to doing, which is an in situ study. You go and live with people in their natural habitat for a lengthy period of time and you study. This kind of a thing is not ruled out. So what kind of an alternative would come? In fact, one of the alternatives which we have used, used without in fact thinking that it was an alternative was the use of smartphones. Incidentally, there's something called smart ethnography. The word which has come into existence. And on 14th of July of uh, this, you know, I will be speaking, I'll be giving a lecture on smart ethnography. So this has come up. What is the best way to connect to the people is to ring them up, is to ask them about their welfare, is to find out the kind of problem they are, they are having. And I was able to collect valuable information by speaking to the people, also looking at the website, looking at what is called cyber ethnographic uh, uh, ethnographies or cyber ethnographic work, and also look, you know, talking to people. I always believe that you should not ignore your own family, your own household. You speak to the people in your household, and you will come to have a wealth of, uh, of information. And on the basis of this, I have tried to you know, and with very few uh, uh, words, I will try to tell you what I have been able to able to find. The other thing which many of us tend to ignore, although we should not ignore, is that we tend to think that these communities about which we are talking, the so-called tribal communities or the other kinds of communities like denotified and other, these communities are passive. I remember. Professor B.K. Roy Berman was always rebutting this idea that to think that the communities are passive, as if they are just sitting like a fatalistic category, just waiting for the doles to come, and, uh, and they are not taking any kind of an initiative. This kind of the thinking was generated by when the paradigms of Western development came. The people do not know what they need. And therefore, we are the ones who have to point out what is that the people, people need. And Roy Berman's idea on which I'm building up, and I'm quite convinced about this idea, is that people certainly are not passive. They are making their active efforts to do, to cope up with the situation. These efforts could be called indigenous efforts. So in fact, in my presentation, there'll be two aspects. The first aspect will be how, how the, 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 the contemporary pandemic situation, the, the contemporary situation, how it has impacted the tribal communities. And secondly, what are the indigenous responses responses to, to this and surely the kind of insights which emerge from conducting smart ethnography done with a smartphone the kind of uh, material we have collected from the newspaper the kind of material we have connected from the social media websites and also speaking to people speaking to friends who are all around connecting with them electronically or digitally so the information which we have collected and the ideas which emerge from this they tomorrow can be tested in the actual field situation let's hope for the best that the the normal which earlier was this return, the pre-COVID situation return, and we are able to carry out the kind of work we had been we had been carrying out. And many of these things will be will be tested. So right now, whatever we are seeing is likely to be tentative, is likely to be hypothetical, is likely to be conjectural as well. Because we have not conducted any kind of a rigorous study. Let me begin with the three very important aspects which provide some kind of a theoretical background. I think all anthropology students know that there was a term called new sphere and develop. New, new sphere, which was popularized by, by Dilhar de Chardin, 
I remember Professor J.D. Mehra, my teacher, used to refer to his work. And a, and a Russian scholar called Vladimir you know, Vernets, uh, Vernetsky. Now, these people popularized the term new sphere. And by new sphere, they meant the effect of the scientific thought, the effect of the human consciousness, the effect of the human thinking on the geological age, how the age is modified by then. Now, in the 1960s, the term which came into existence was Anthropocene. And this word has now become a part of our vocabulary, notwithstanding the fact that the International Union of Geological Science has not accepted its, its use. However, this word has come in the discipline of anthropology, and we speak of what is called Anthropocene anthropology, with the way in which human beings affect the environment, the way in which human beings transform the environment, and therefore they have to see the dialectical relationship they have with the environment. And many of the problems which we are having today are because of the overuse of the environment, are because of the despoliation of the environment and despoliation of the nature. So we kept on, on playing with the nature. We kept on dealing with the nature, not realizing the ruthlessness nature is ruthless in, 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 in their understanding. And therefore, we all went around this. And in this context, the Anthropocene anthropology becomes very important. And this is the kind of, one of the kind of discourses which is coming up again and again, that, that we are the sinners and we have caused this kind of a thing to happen. Now, what we have done is having its effect on the communities which have been rather protective about the environment. What we have done, what we have done, you know, in the Western setup, in the developed setup, in the so-called scientifically, you know, developed setup is affecting the tribal communities who, on the other hand, have been rather protective about the environment. And this is something which anthropology has time and again has substantiated this idea that tribes have been, the tribal communities have been very respectful towards their environment and have been able to protect it, have been able to protect the biodiversity. So that's the first aspect which comes up. The second aspect which comes up is that if you look at the, the Spanish flu or if you look at the other pandemic, you find that disease, disease has the tremendous ability, tremendous ability to transform the patient who is a victim, to transform the patient into an enemy. Now, this is an important idea that how disease is transforming is leading to the metamorphosis of the patient into an enemy. Not only just the, the, the patient, but also the kith and kin of the patient, those who are related with the, with the patient. So, you find that disease produces a situation which is often called compassion deficit situation. Suddenly it seems that our compassion, our altruism goes away. As a footnote, I will add, it was August Comte who gave the term altruism and he argued that human beings have an important characteristic and that characteristic is that they are altruistic and they are able to help uh, help others and they have the ability to help others and suddenly you find that this kind of an altruism this kind of a compassion this disappear now since since the whole situation has to be brought under control for example quarantine has to be ruthless social distancing has to be enforced you know washing of the hands supposed to be supposed to be very important and so you know <laughs> these things have to be enforced these things have to be, to, be, to be reinforced what you find is that the rules are 
are enforced far more stringently than the situation is 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 that otherwise relaxations are not not tolerated rules reign rules reign and sometimes i am reminded of of uh, uh, max weber who talked about uh, that following the rules and forcing the rules is the right way of managing it so it comes a situation where on the one hand you have compassion deficit and on the other hand you find you find that that uh, 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 you know the rules are enforced and the term ruthless is often often used you can look at the examples from all over the world that how these rules have been enforced far more stringently people have been subjected to corporeal punishment people have been fined or people have as a case of philippines tells us that they have been rather brutally dealt with so these things come, comes you know within this the second point comes the whole notion of what is called super spreaders under court super spreader the communities which are supposed to be the super spreader i call these communities quasi communities like for example the migrant laborers those who are coming from their own area they are already in a state of destitution they are already in a state of penury and what actually happens is that they are further they are further stigmatized and they are further treated as victim and they suffer from the compassion deficit of the of the society now we we do not realize we do not realize that these sick need the assistant they need the help and in fact it is for the government message to tell you that you hate the sickness and not the people who are who are sick you know these things have to be told to other because there's some kind of a deficit on our our part we do not realize we do not realize that these people by suffering and this is a this is an interesting idea these people by suffering they have been some kind of under court whistle blowers that others have come to know about uh, about it this is an interesting idea that because they suffered and we started investigating we came to know what kind of a thing is there and i think this hypothesis of uh, of whistle blowing this can be tested when we go back to uh, the first week of december when retrospectively china announced that that was the beginning of uh, of the virus virus affecting and jeopardizing the upper respiratory tract so you find that this kind of a super spreading so rather than considering these people as those who have have offered their body to the virus offered their body or the body was offered and therefore they have brought this knowledge to our our thinking and also in one way they have been sentinels sentinels in the sense that now they are the ones who are who are donating their plasma they are the ones who are you know saving the lives of others so instead of thinking in a positive manner what actually happens is that in this um, in this compassion deficit society we find we find that things are very different very very different and you have umpteen cases of this stigma stigma as a process and stigma as a product the third thing which i want to take up here is is that is that all over the world we have been arguing in favor of reduction of inequalities that has been the major thing that we have to reduce inequality you look at any discipline whether it is economics or it is law or political science or anthropology none of these disciplines is ever arguing in favor of inequalities 
and just compare it what the situation was maybe 100 years ago when we justified inequalities, whether this inequality was of class or this inequality was of caste or any other kind of inequality. And we have been rather, you know, concertedly with, with the consciousness, with the with diligence, we are trying to work towards the elimination of these, these inequalities so that we have a kind of system which is egalitarian, a kind of system in which equality prevails, a kind of system in which people are able to live with dignity, a kind of system in which justice is made available. These are the ideal categories and we try to approach these ideal, ideal categories. But see, what happens in reality? And this is an important idea which social scientists cannot ignore, is that these types of situations, they expose the existing inequalities in the society. Sometimes we start wondering, we start wondering whether these inequalities were ever affected or these inequalities can continue as some kind of an infallible category. They were always there, and these inequalities were, were temporarily, they were shrouded. They were temporarily, they were covered. It was just a veneer. But in fact, these inequalities were there, and these inequalities have, have come into, into, into existence. And it will be an important piece of research to point out how pandemic exposes the inequality, how inequality inequalities come, how inequalities which had almost been pushed to the back seat, these inequalities come in a very big way. And you have almost the ominous gin of inequality hanging on, on you. Now, this is an important thing. The link with this is, is look at the entire discourse. You know, there were stories after stories where people enjoyed the lockdown. They were able to paint, they were able to sing, they were able to, to read, they were able to see films, just park themselves before the television, and they were able to enjoy everything. Well, they were able to buy, buy Ayurvedic stuff to raise their immunity. They were able to buy vitamin E, B complex, calcium, etc. Et and also they were able to, able to have clean water. They were able to have, uh, have good food and everything was being served to them. They were able to buy from the market. This is, I would like to submit, this is a very middle class view. A middle class view which has been circulating in the media and uh, media is pro middle class and that is why you know about it and that is why in our discourses in our discourses we always say we always say well this is what you've done and lockdown was a great experience for for me and i was able to live very well and as you know that even now the lockdown is continuing. I am in, in Calcutta and I know that a large number of people are not able to come to the office and they are working from home. Whether they are working or not working is a, is a different question. But you can look at these experiences of the people. They are very good because our salary is coming, because our pension money is coming easily. Whether we do the work or do not do the work, the the Provisions are coming easily. You can book any kind of provisions, any kind of uh, thing, and they come very easily, easily uh, at work. And we are able to enjoy the comfort. Many people have, uh, when I spoke to them, they have told me their health has improved. They are less tense. And, and some of them even went to the extent of saying that now they are in a clean environment. And needless to say, we have heard a lot about it, that how the rivers are clean, how you're able to see mountain ranges, and you see the birds, the birds which had earlier almost disappeared, so everything is around it. Now, but do not forget, there are two kinds of jobs. 
One is, and this is a heuristic uh, classification, one is the jobs which I can do sitting at home. I can work from my home. I did a lot of writing. I read a lot of report sitting in my own house. But there are jobs which would compulsorily require you to go out. You can't, you can't be homebound for that. Your domestic help has to come to your house to work. Your driver has come to your house to, to, to work. The hawker and the vendor has to come to your house to, to sell. So these people who require a kind of kind of mobility, one can one can easily make a distinction between people for whom sedentarization is not really a, a problem. And in fact, they love sedentarization and they would love to be there. And I'm sure people who have been home for the last two months, three months or so, they don't feel like going to the office and they feel very happy, very content. Being, uh, being there because the thing that I can work from the home and so there is not a problem. But come to the rickshaw pullers, come to people who are in the tertiary sector of the economy. Just see what is happening to, to them. There are newspaper reports after report that there have been technologically qualified people who have been working in the companies and today they are they are working for Manrega, trying to get little money so that they can buy buy vegetables. They have not been paid their salary for the last two to three months. In fact, in Delhi, I know many households who in fact paid their domestic helps salary when they were not able to come just because of the lockdown. But many of them did not. Many of them did not. They just did not bother about, uh, about, about it. And therefore, therefore, we have to keep that particular section in, in mind. And to my understanding, the tribal communities belong to the second category. People who have to go out to to, to, to work. People who, who are not professional, they have to go and collect leave. They have to bring it. They have to have to have, uh, have uh, the traders coming to, to them. They have to sell them. Now here we have to look at, and I'm gradually coming to the close of my, my, my presentation. We have to look at the way in which tribal communities have been affected. I have tried to evolve some kind of a classification of the tribal communities, keeping in the contemporary thing. And tomorrow or one day, I would be writing it up. There is no need to tell you that tribal economies are mixed economies. It is not that if they are pastoralists, they will always remain pastoralists. On the contrary, they may move from one kind of economic system to the other. One of the greatest contributions of Sir Edward Evans Pritchard was in his book called The New Way to say that how the social structure and the life is regulated by the ecological cycle. And so was Marcel Moss's contribution to the understanding of Eskimo, that how these ecological factors have a very important role to play in the lives of, of, of people. So, so we can easily think of, you know, keeping in mind this, we can think of four categories of the tribal communities, contemporary tribal communities. The first could be called the foragers. And these foragers are those who are still dependent upon, upon hunting and food gathering. And these foragers can be further divided into two categories where those for foragers who are relatively isolated. Now, the only uncontacted um, community in the world today and India is the Sentinelese. They have no contact with the outside world and they're totally isolated. And so 
they have their own system of foraging and they live there. Whatever little information we have, my colleague has written a book on, on the Sentinelese, which is being published. So these people are totally isolated. There are other communities like Ponge and, uh, and Andaman Islanders, the Great Andamanis. They are the ones who are also in, in areas where they are isolated, although they are in contact with the health staff, with the other people who are providing every kind of assistance to them. Now, the second category of foragers is of those who are indulging in foraging, but they are in contact with the other communities. They are not as isolated as are these, these communities. They have come in contact with the other communities. Now, in the second category, we would place the Jarva of Andaman uh, Island. And those of you who have been to the Andaman, they know it very well that these Jarvas have been in contact with the, the, the nearby settlers, those who are largely Bengali population. And they have some kind of a barter relationship with them. So they are foragers, but they have some kind of a barter relation with them. The second category of tribes are producers. Those could be divided into shifting cultivators and those who are plow cultivators. Two categories. And, and each community has been differentially affected. Then third, you have the peripatetic communities, people who are on move. And these peri peripatetic communities, those who are, are nomadic, those who are moving, they can be divided into two categories. One, those who are animal herders, those who are pastoralists. And the second category is of those who are, a broad category could be called, they are the entertainers, they are those who sell medicine, they are the ones who are arms seeker. A large number of communities in Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, communities which we studied, they are into arms seeking. And then there are fortune tellers, people who are into a variety of occupations. You can have here those who play puppet, or those who entertain with animals, a large category of these people whose whose livelihood is dependent upon their mobility and looking for their client. And lastly, we have the urban and industrial tribal communities. And they are the ones who are a part of the urban setup. They are a part of the, of the, um, you know, the, the industrial communities where they are working. And obviously, you know, once the communities you know, have to move out because the industry is closed, the factory is closed, they are likely to, to, to suffer. Now, my submission is that each of these four communities, each of them has different kinds of problems and have been affected. And they have been affected by the COVID situation differentially. So there can't be one kind of a model. And this, this submission which I'm making here, this is, uh, is in line with the fact that tribal communities in India are not homogeneous and therefore they cannot be one situation. For example, let us take up, uh, take up the case of the Andaman communities. Now, I mean, this is all based on newspapers and also, you know, uh, speaking to, to people, as you know, that they have the most vulnerable communities. And in fact, uh, it was seen in the case of Brazil. It was seen in the case of Canada, where the cases of COVID-19 came. And we really started fearing that once the disease spreads, it is going to affect the entire population. And it will be very difficult to, to, to you know, help them in any way. It is also because of the fact that most of these communities, they have uh, some kind of a communal living, meaning thereby the large, large settlement and all of them are, are together. A kind of social distancing which we talk of is almost absent. So like in the Jarva case, a tanda, 
which is the hut, it will have all the members of the household. They will all be together. And then the tanda will be a little far off. So all of them are together, some kind of a joint living. And if this were to happen, uh, you're just going to be going to be affected. Therefore, certain actions need to be taken. Once you know, it came to the knowledge of the Andaman administration that 10 people suffered from COVID-19, nine who had traveled from, from Delhi. And of these nine, I think uh, uh, eight were uh, non-tribal and one happened to be Nukobari, but the facts, of course, can be checked. And one happened to be the wife of uh, one. When these 10 people came and it was found that they were positive, immediately the Andaman administration swung into action. The ATR, the Andaman Trunk Road, was closed only for very necessary things, supplies, it is otherwise not. Fishing and hunting was completely stopped. Moreover, the problem was not with the Unge and the, the Great Andamani. The problem was with the Jarwad because Jarwad have started coming out. They are, as I told you, they are in contact with the neighboring communities and they had to be persuaded. These Jarwads had to be persuaded to go back to their, their forest abodes. And they had to be told, communicated, that the kind of, um, of uh, illness which has come. And this was done very effectively. The AAJVS worker, you know, those who are field workers and they work with the Jarvas, they carried with them the, the videotapes and they were able to show people what it is. They were able to communicate with them. And gradually people understood the gravity of the whole thing. Their local ideas would be different. For example, among the Kolam. Among the Kolam, the elders said that this is some kind of a war. You know, the war model. Some kind of war. There's something which has come and it is going to affect you. So you should be prepared for this kind of war. And the Prime Minister, the Honourable Prime Minister, wants you to be prepared for that. So there can be different kinds of belief system which can be affected. It is because the disease has come because we have all been sinners. That is unimportant. What is important is the persuasion on the part of the people. The field workers, they also told the Jarava that, look, you have not to come out. You have to be there. And if you notice any of these symptoms, the symptoms which are flu-like symptoms, in case you see any of these symptoms, you must immediately contact us. You can come down and you can always, uh, always uh, uh, come in contact with us. Each police station close to the Jarva settlement, it had a nurse, it had a midwife, it also had uh, a driver to drive the motorboat, it also had uh, health workers, it also had the the field worker, and the doctor was available on call. Right? So if any, anyone were to have these symptoms, the medical system will be there. And Andaman administration said, this is the main thing. The field workers were also taught. And this is a part of the whole design of social distancing. The field workers were also taught that they have not to contact the Jarva. They have not to contact them. They have to effectively communicate with them that in case the Jarvas have any problem, they must come and contact them because they have to observe the distance. And that is how they would be able to, able to learn. Fortunately, the administration did a commendable job and things are quite well, notwithstanding the fact that the numbers of the, of the people suffering from coronavirus, this has increased. Now, this kind of a strategy which was adopted and how people were made to understand this. This was very different from the case where minor forest products had to be had to be collected. And there you come across a large number of the case studies. Some of them have been reported by media as well. That how the, for example, among the Santhal, that in the month of uh, month from March to June. This is the time of collection. They collect mahua leaves, they collect karanji seed, they collect tam uh, tamarind, and uh, they were able to earn from all these collection of the non-timber product something like 25,000 rupees. Now, after this, what has happened is that uh, 
their sale has plummeted by 70% or so it has it has gone down so so um well um well uh, how the entire life was affected in fact some of the work which was done by trifed you know they wrote to the ministry of uh, of uh, tribal affairs they said do you start one than center so that the tribes could come and sell their product because as i told you right in the beginning that uh, right in the beginning i told you that uh, uh, the problem was not of collection they collected the problem was of selling them off and they all knew they knew very well that the rains would arrive soon and the product will get fungus and so this will not be of any and you so this kind of a worry was there but you know uh, the ministry of tribal affairs and trifed they worked uh, together and they were able to able to come out with certain kinds of um, of of solution lot of material is available i have a number of uh, case studies dealing with this that how the communities were were affected and kind of procedures which came up for example you know the traders who buy wheat they often give a slip See, you know slip is that the product has been acquired and the money will be given later now the traders wanted those who wanted to buy the mahua flour they also said that we would give this kind of a slip and on which it would be written that it has been acquired but people wanted cash so there were conflicts with this and of course the 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 non governmental organization of us have to had to step in now the important part was was that that we paid a lot of attention to these one dhan one dhan vikas kendra very important and we realized how effective this could be so that the people could be saved from what is called distress sale which was was happening and also the collection of the tendu leaves this must be must be regulated so kind of economic programs for that which came up and an interesting thing once we start with the field work would be that what was the impact of these thing how people were affected by uh, by 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 this and what kind of strategies they adopted what kind of views they they pointed out now those who had now those who had had been living the peripatetic life they suffered a lot mainly because they were migrating they were not allowed to to go out for example the snake charmers the magicians those who who worked with the rope the rope walkers the rope trick players the those who played the the puppet they were not recognized by the by the state and uh, obviously you know they suffered a lot in fact we found in our project dealing with the denotified communities we found that a number of denotified tribes had left their ancestral work because this ancestral work you know was not needed people did not want to see the puppet show they did not want to patronize it people did want to see the magic shows or the rope uh, trick now one option was that they could contact a daily heart or such kinds of um, of uh, you know institutions where traditional uh, you know uh, arts are uh, displayed or they had to look for some patron who can take them to foreign country and they are able to display their or just to leave it and a large number of them we found in our project dealing with the with these communities and we have closely studied you know 160 communities or so we found that a large number of these denotified communities nomadic and semi nomadic community they left their ancestral work and they became construction workers they became domestic workers they became truck driver they became rag picker they became the daily worker daily 
home uh, wage worker or some of them just took to begging you know my colleague used to say that if you survey the households in delhi you would find that a large number of these households in delhi they have employed the domestic help from one or the other tribal area just because the middle classes are less concerned about who all come and work there but as anthropologists you have a different eye i always believe that the anthropologists are different from the others you have a different eye you have a different way of seeing and if you see you'll find a large number of them are from the tribal area and if you start investigating you would find that just few years ago they were proud owners of land just few years ago they were working and now the land was taken away for one or the other development project or they were they were ousted because some other project was going to come up and they had no option but to come to the urban area to work where they could at least get the food so now these people who were who were working in various kinds of the factories no one bothers to find out who they are no one bothers to find out why they are what they are but once we start the study we would find they are the walter fernandes used to use this term they are asset less people they do not have any any assets and because they are asset less people they have no op- option but to depress into the class which today after the reverse migration occurred the class which has come to be known as walking class because the class was walking the people were walking you could see them you could see them uh, their picture and the, the stories of these walks are so heartrending that i don't want to want to repeat but we were really touched by that and now they came back to their villages and they realized that uh, not much is there they will have to go back they will have to go back and of course when they went back they were welcome we have a we have a case from punjab where when these workers came they were garlanded they were given laddus and they were welcomed but they had to go for quarantine and one of the questions was that who is going to give them food and who is going to pay for them during the quarantine period now these issues which which came up in which a large number of communities both tribal and non tribal have have suffered and this this experience of the reverse migration will always always remain and we will always be touched by by the thing we find several cases where and this is all based on newspaper report several cases where the tribal people working in urban and and industrial area they lost their jobs they were stranded the the editorial in the newspaper called the hindu on 9th may it talked about the collective misery of the migrant workers that how a large number of them were just stranded and they were not able to able to to return then there were cases of people who were stranded without food like the case of the soliga tribes in karnataka this was reported by the new indian express and the impact of that report was that the government immediately extended help to these people and after reading this i was uh, i was a little happy that at least the the government listened to the plight of these people we had many other cases where for example the study from surat it pointed out that the landlords the contractor those who were who were helping these people they simply disappeared they simply went away leaving the workers so who will pay their wages and who will look after them and there were cases of uh, hunger like this case which actually was really heart touching was of the gond tribes in panna and these workers they were returning home in uh, droves and uh, they they had nothing to eat and in fact for days together what they ate was 
roti with salt that was the whole thing and you can imagine the kind of mal nutrition with which they would they would suffer we already know the the instances of racism which came up i would use the word ethnicism the cases of ethnicism which uh, which came up i only want to draw your attention to to we know from the newspaper the kind of words which were used for the tribal communities from the northeast but this is not a new thing it happened in the past i think all of you will refurbish your memory that in 2014 this boy from and from, from uh, arunachal pradesh you know he was uh, attacked by the shopkeeper because the shopkeeper were, were making fun of his hair and also uh, his dress and he picked up uh, a fight with them and how they beat him up with the result that he he died and uh, and after that uh, police came out with some kind of advisory for the people and so on and so forth home ministry also wrote these things have happened but the most recent report is of rights and risks analysis group rights and risk analysis group the report is available they study the cases and each of these cases has been documented they studied these cases from 7th of february to 25th of march and they found 22 cases of where where stigma discrimination verbal abuse you know uh, uh, forcible quarantine all these were adopted and people had to undergo undergo humiliation for for, for this they counted and one can one can see all this and many people wrote about this to 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 people now finally i'll come and this will not take uh, much time another few two or three minutes or so and this i go back and i remind you of what i said in the beginning that communities are active they also think one of the greatest contributions of anthropologists has been where they differed from their peer group in other social sciences is people's indigenous efforts the indigenous efforts to to cope with the situation to bring the situation under control sometimes in anthropology we use the word efforts from below to contrast these with efforts from above the efforts from below now these efforts which were made which have not been i don't think they have been reported adequately well in the kind of literature i have seen perhaps field work will be able to throw more light on this these efforts in fact fall into two categories number one some outsiders some motivated people you know they they carried out activities among the tribal people trying to help them so there is a case of which i i really like and i thought that i must take up this study later this was from the purulia district and what happened was a group of students you just see group of student it is not a non governmental organization is group of student they assembled and they decided to take care of the food of the people the tribal women in purulia district they adopted some village and then started started doing it once they started distributing food they found that uh, these women needed some more they needed sanitary you know uh, you know pads they also needed uh, needed uh, uh, baby food they needed other things as well and so what they did was pulling their own money they started what is called traveling market and this traveling market sold everything for 1 rupee it was called ek takar bazaar taka is is the bengali word for money so each thing was sold for 1 rupee and uh, and i i learned from the uh, from the report that they traveled at least 23 villages where they were able to help now these kinds of commendable efforts 
which have come. I have tried to document some of them in another article I wrote on a stigma, where I'm talking about the villages in, in Odisha, where the, the, how the, these kinds of groups, which in fact later on became quasi groups, they were able to help. But, but the people themselves took the lead and they were able to, able to do. There's a very interesting story. And the story is that uh, one of the social workers who was in contact with the Chinchu, uh, he rang them up to find out how they were. And after some time, he received, she, she received a call from the Chinchu men who said, well, I'm, uh, I'm on the tree. I have climbed the tree because uh, network was not coming. And he said that, that once we came to know and those who came from outside, the social workers and others and police and other people, health workers, once they told us that the best way to survive this pandemic is to isolate yourself. So what we have done is we have moved to the forest to isolate ourselves okay, and we are you know, collecting and we are surviving here so that so that uh, uh, we are able to fight this and we do not allow any outsider outsider to, to come. Now here, there are two situations which we come across. The first situation is where those tribes who have land, they have been able to survive very well. Because they moved to their land in Rajasthan, they used the word Bera, you know, where the, the water is there, the field is there, and they were able to live. But those tribal communities which had become landless, they had no option but to but to move out. Those who had been evicted from land, like the story of Jenu Kuruba, is very well known that they had to leave the land for giving land to the tiger reserve. They were they were you know, daily wage workers. And obviously, during the lockdown, you know, they had uh, no option but to survive on the help which was coming from, from, uh, from the local community. Then there are very interesting stories of the indigenous methods of quarantining. And I think these stories, these studies require that what the communities did, the kind of bamboo gates they put up on the village roads and how the local people used to patrol and thus to keep the outsiders away. So these workers, you know, they looked after, you know, this is the case from Mizoram, uh, the community is called Mara and where, you know, they were able to take care of the family. If they didn't have food, they were able to, able to provide and thus they were able to do a, a lot. Now, the same kind of thing came up in the case of Bastar. In Bastar, there was an additional advantage. The additional advantage was, and those who have been to Bastar, they know it, that the houses are very big. And there's a big courtyard outside the house. And so the distance between one house and the other house is quite large. And therefore, it was easy for people to quarantine. And also we have found, this is from our own study, we have found that people go individually to do the collection rather than going in a, in a, a group. And the bounties were kept and so the, the barricades were erected and those workers who came from outside, which happened in Telangana also, they were asked to stay outside, mix shift arrangements, some kind of lean-to arrangements was made for them. and the people provided food to, to them and so that there was no thing. And communities themselves were able to put a car on their customs and their festivals. For example, Bastar is very well known for the foul fight, what is called cock fight. And this is such an important thing of the, of the community. But this time, the community collectively decided that we would not... Uh, we would not do it. Now, these are the kind of efforts which were made. And finally, we have a number of cases where face masks were made from leaves. And some of these are very interesting. For example, the Goti Koya. This was reported in the 
in the newspaper also with the teak leaves the kind of masks they they wore and uh, they knew that these masks they knew that these they knew that these masks had to be changed and they were doing it they were understanding the whole thing so the idea seeped in and the people were vigilant about it and this attests the fact that the communities communities were not uh, were not passive they also thought of uh, thought of helping themselves with the result with the result that that uh, bastar did not report even a single case of uh, of covid and if i go by the information which was uh, given by the secretary ministry of tribal affairs that uh, they were, <laughs> they were only till the 2nd may you bhai bhai this is not a phone pe na padega they were only 25 tribes were suffering from covid-19 we do not know the the recent figure so we as anthropologists now i'm coming to some kind of a broad summary we as anthropologists have to realize against the background of these case studies that the impact of coronavirus the impact of covid-19 has been different in different communities and let us not let us not judge the entire indian situation in terms of in terms of the middle class and upper middle class household to which we belong now it will be an interesting thing to ask the kind of things which people were using for washing their hands the local herbs which they were they were using they knew very well that how it it spreads people don't think don't think that they will have to read the internet website to know how the virus is spreading they know about it and and what kind of arrangement they were arriving at from the resources which were available there and the understanding of this will be an important contribution of the anthropologists towards the differential understanding of the community in the times of covid-19 thank you very much i am grateful to the department of anthropology delhi university for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with you and also also to tell the anthropologists that we the anthropologists are improvisers meaning thereby that whichever situation comes we know how to handle this we know how in difficult field situations we are able to improvise methods of data collection or improvise the methods of writing up our of notes and this improvisation has to be done in these days as well thank you very much i wish you all the best and i wish the soon we have corona free pandemic free environment grateful to you.